All right. Rade, Rade, everybody. We're going to start. Nice to see you. We continue the project, the service that I was mercifully given by Gurudev to read together with you Bhagavad Gita in a very specific way. We all know, I think, that um, Bhagavad Gita is based on many, many principles of psychology and philosophy and theology and spirituality coming from uh, Upanishad and other places. But then that Prabhupada had the, the genius um, and Gurudev had the inspiration to use these, this book as to show the path to bhakti, to show the way that these themes and subjects and concepts were already saturated with rasa, that they were already part of the movement towards devotion. So what we're trying to do in this reading together of Bhagavad Gita is to bring out the devotional aspect of Bhagavad Gita, to bring out the feeling, to read it as an exercise in emotion and in devotional uh, experience. Many people call it the introduction to bhakti. One of them, the most important one is of course, Prabh Prabhupada himself, who tries to underline everywhere. And then I try to underline it again on his behalf, the way that the links to bhakti are everywhere in, in the text. And particular, as you know, uh, starting in chapter nine which is where we started last time after two or three sessions of, uh, of introduction. Another reminder from the, from the introduction is uh, the two primary blockages that Prabhupada talks about, reminds us of, blockages to spiritual uh, advancement. The one is that we, are, we believe that we are the creators of the world, were the makers of the world, were the architects or the authors of the world. And the second, which goes hand in hand with the first, that we're the sole enjoyers of the world, that the world is made for our pleasure. For uh, our pleasure, for our benefit. I try to speak louder, good day. Yeah. Um, So these are the two basic hurdles to start with that we want to overcome in our reading, to get past this idea that we are the authors of the world and that we are the enjoyers of the world. And instead to view our place in spiritual life as being part of a flow, being part of the energy of the universe flowing through us. It doesn't start with us, it doesn't end with us, it flows through us. And to the degree that we can attach to it, we can contribute to it and be, uh, be part of it. And this is why we remember every time, every lesson, we remember our prampara. We remember and give thanks and respects to, to our dear Gurudev, to our Param Gurudev, uh, Radha Govinda Das Babaji, to Prabhupada himself, the translator and author of the of the uh, commentaries. And then we think and remember the Goswamis, in particular Rupa and Raghunatha Das. We think about Ananta Das Babaji, who gives us so much poetry to bring out the emotion of our own tradition. And then, of course, we think about and remember Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and Radha Mohan. Uh, it goes without um, saying. So remembering is a very important part of bhakti. You might remember, we talked in the very first lesson about the nine paths to bhakti. So Prabhupada told us about the nine elements on the path uh, to bhakti. I won't repeat them all, but one of them, you probably remember, is smarana or smaranam, which means remembering God or remembering the qualities of God or if you like, remembering divinity. 
yesterday we just we had a very big day of of remembering guru purnima and we spent lots of the day remembering and thinking and in the and in the um the sharing yesterday afternoon we we told stories and memories of 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 guru but there's something already very special to underline about remembering which separates the west from the east in western thinking and most of us are westerners when we remember with we're remembering something outside of ourselves remembering something maybe we lost or something that's left something that's not here something that's mm, external to ourselves and remembering it means somehow bringing it back you know at least in a symbolic way but smaranam is a different kind of remembering it's remembering from the inside it's remembering guru within us it's remembering god within us it's remembering the quality of guru and god which are already within us but with which we've lost somehow contact because of the coverings of maya because of the coverings of the um material world so we spend lots of time in an external understanding of remembering as westerners but we must try to change our way of thinking to remember that part of god and that part of guru that's in our own soul within our own uh, soul consciousness in bhakti thinking god is everywhere and we are part and parcel of god we are a little bit of god in every one of us a little bit of the super soul is in us in our own soul but it gets covered up it gets it gets covered up by our material thinking and it gets covered up by maya so try to release this idea that we need to go outside us to find god and guru and think more uh, directly about the idea that we want to find god and guru um within us then to let's see let's turn to where we left off last time if i can find it myself there we go it was we just read um the first verse of chapter 9 and we just about completed it but there was one last bit and i want to bring it up for you and we'll look at it together right at the end of the verse right at the end of the prabhupad's commentary i mean we talked about envy and gopika didi had a very beautiful and important sharing about the relationship to envy between envy and our contact with our soul consciousness and she talked about the way that envy blocks our way to soul consciousness and that's a very good way to start prabhupad's commentary on envy uh, as well so i'll read for you here at the bottom of the the page the sanskrit word prabhupad prabhupad says anasuyava in this verse is very significant envy envy is a very significant word in the verse generally he says the commentators even if they are highly scholarly are all envious of krishna the supreme personality of godhead even the most erudite even the most educated scholars write on bhagavad gita very inaccurately because they are envious of krishna their commentaries are useless the commentaries given by devotees of the lord 
are bona fide. No one can explain Bhagavad Gita or give perfect knowledge of Krishna if he is envious. One who characterizes the character of Krishna without knowing him is a fool. So such commentaries should be very carefully avoided. For one who understands that Krishna is Supreme Personality of Godhead, the pure transcendental personality, these chapters will be very beneficial. Now let's look back at some of the elements of this commentary that are important for us. First and foremost, again and again, Prabhupada underlines that we're talking about the personality of Godhead, the personal side of God, the, the personal fabric, texture, feeling of God. So Krishna understood in the way that Prabhupada understands is full of variation and emotion and, and, and feeling and it's changing and it's individual and it relates to each living jiva in a different way. It's not the impersonal Brahman that many speak of, which is just one homogenous power for everyone. The second thing we want to look at is the way that Prabhupada talks about educated scholars, erudite scholars. He says it three times. These are the philosophers who are looking only at the doctrine and looking only at the words and the concepts and they're missing the feeling. They're missing the emotion that carries the text the emotion that energizes the text. And as we saw last time, the presence of Radha in the text. It is Radha's energy, the energy of uh, pleasure that brings the cold, dry words into our hearts, into our souls. And that's the core of Prabhupada's understanding of Bhagavad Gita. And that's what he's putting his finger on uh, in this, uh, in this uh, commentary. So being envious of Krishna means being all intelligent like Krishna. The scholars think they understand Krishna just like Krishna does, and that they, they can explain Krishna just like it was the boy next door. And this is a matter of not only of uh, arrogance, but of, of envy. Envy. Let's take a minute and think a little more about envy now. Um, envy is itself a kind of love. It's not the good kind of love, but it's related to love. It's certainly, when you see someone envious, you know that this person is looking for love looking to be loved, and looking to love. So we can ask ourselves, what is the relation between envy, a very impure, corrupt kind of love, and the true love that we are all searching for? Envy, envy is the name of the confusion between having and being. Envy is the name of the confusion between having and being. Envy is love for what we have, or for, for what the other has, and not for what we are, or for what the other is. Envy means to think, I love you because you have beautiful hair. I love you because of your charming eyes. I love you for your strong muscles. I love you for your long car. I love you for your big house, for your clothes, for your voice, for your job. 
all these outward things that somehow are linked to our inward self, but in a very distant and unclear and impure way. These, this is loving as envy, loving you for what you have, loving you not seeing what you are or who you are. I'm loving your qualities and not your soul. The highest love for the other, if we want to imagine a perfect love for the other, I'm sure you could tell me what you think it is. It's love of the other's soul. It comes from our soul and it applies um, to the other soul. So we need to ask, when we're talking about envy the way Prabhupada does, what is covering that relation to the soul of ourself and the soul of the other? We have to look at ourselves and ask what is making us experience love as having and not love as being. And to do that, I suppose, we need to understand the relationship between having and being and make stronger the, the, the focus on our own being, our, our own identity as spiritual beings to make stronger the path between our outward expression and our inward spiritual self. So what I'm trying to say is that the, the task is not to give up our outward appearance. We all have a nose and eyes and a mouth and a voice and, and all the rest. We can't stop having this. But to look for the depth of being in our spiritual identity as it connects to that outward being connect the qualities of what we have in material consciousness to the qualities of what we have in spiritual consciousness, to connect having and being. And then comes the question, where are they closest together? When is having the same as being? And I'll bet you know the answer to that one too. It's in prema. It's in divine love. Look at our dear Radha Mohan. Or Radharani. Radharani is the one being for whom having and being are the same. The love that Radharani has is the same as the love that Radharani is. It's the perfect antidote, the perfect medicine to envy, to focus on bringing together what we have, bringing them into unity, what we have and who we are. So that when Radha and Mohan say to each other, I am yours, you are mine. This beautiful line that we often talk about with Gurudev, I am yours, you are mine. This means essentially, I am you and you are me. We're so close together in our identity that there's no such thing as possessing, but being having you is being as close as possible together with you. I have you so intensely. I have you so completely that it's just like being you. So when I say I love you to, to you, to my brothers and sisters, to my husband, to my wife, to my lover, to my, to my friend, I'm saying that also to the divine soul, the divine part of my friend, to my lover, my husband. I'm looking in that very divine part and parcel of, 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 of God and saying we are together and we should be closer together. So this is one look at envy and a path, sort of practical path towards thinking about envy um, in the future. That said, let's move on now to the next verse, 9.2. And here, you can start by reading the verse. This knowledge is the king of education, the most secret of all secrets. It is the purest knowledge. And because it gives direct perception 
of the self, by realization, it is the perfection of religion. It is everlasting and it is joyfully performed. So what Krishna is saying to Arjuna here is that this knowledge I'm giving you today, this is the topmost knowledge, the best knowledge, and it's the perfection of religion, and it's the direct perception. And I want to come back to all these little elements and say a word or two. But first, let's look up at the Sanskrit. It's quite beautiful. Raja Vidya Raja Guyam. So Raja, you know this word already. It means king or kingdom. Raja is kingdom, actually. Raj is king, like Mungaraj Mandir, kingdom of Mungar. So it's the kingdom of knowledge. It's the king of knowledge, Raja Vidya. The topmost king of knowledge. And Raja Guyam, the king of, secret, of secrets, king, king of confidential knowledge. Now, we already talked about knowledge before, last time, and even the time before. But there we talked about jnanam, theoretical knowledge, and vijnanam, realized knowledge. But here we have another word for knowledge, vidya. And vidya is practical knowledge. If you like, it's knowledge in action, which very, very much reminds us of the expression of Gurudev, love in action. And it links together with this, we'll see. Vidya is practical knowledge. Vidya is, um, is the little stories we find everywhere in the Purana, uh, explaining practical knowledge for getting through life's moral problems. It's like the Aesop's fables in Europe, where there's a turtle and there's a dove, and they try to find food together, though they have different interests. So this kind of story with practical knowledge, this is Vidya. And what this is important to say is that devotion is not theoretical knowledge. And it's also not only realized knowledge, it's knowledge we put into practice. Devotion is action. This is why Gurudev says love in action. Devotion is practical knowledge. It's only meaningful if we use it, if we love others with it, if we serve others with it. It's only in this sense that it's helpful. So the translation that Prabhupada gives is king of education. That's a good way to put it. But we might add to that king of practical, useful knowledge. The secret of all secrets. Then there's two other elements that we want to look at here. The one is direct perception, pratyak gamama. This is realized knowledge in the same way we talked about Vigyanam uh, last week. And then it talks about Dharmiyam, perfection of religion. So Dharma is religious rules, regulations, and codes. And when we find devotional knowledge, we transcend that, um, that, rules, that rules and regulations of religion and find a higher level of religion based on emotion, and feeling. So we're back to knowledge. We're back to secrets. The whole chapter is called Secrets, you remember. But I want to tell you a little story about secrets to, to try to make this clearer um, for you. Because what is a secret? Well, it's something we don't know. It's a fact we don't know. I don't know if it's raining outside the temple here today. It's a secret for me. Last week when I arrived, young Radhika made a card trick for me, a trick with the cards. She mixed up the cards and then she said, Udav uncle, take one card, don't show it to me. And I did what she said. I took one card and then Radhika said, I'm going to tell you what this card is now. And she didn't look. And I said, Radhika, impossible. There's no way you can do that. And she said, Udav uncle, it's eight of hearts. And she turned it over. And guess what? It was eight of hearts. And I looked at her and I said, my God, you were right. And then I looked again and this pleasure came over her face. Huge smile and satisfaction and a deep pleasure. So what I realized 
when this happened last week was that secrets are two things at once. The one thing is the fact, the eight of hearts. I didn't know that. It was a secret to me. Now I know because Radhika was nice enough to tell me. But that was the one part. The other part of a secret, the other part of the secret of the card trick, was knowing the system behind the secret. Little Radhika understood the system. She understood the mathematics and the counting and the ordering of the card trick so that she would know what the secret was. Radhika knew two secrets, one about which card it was and the other about how the system worked. And it was knowing the system worked, how the system worked and knowing that I didn't know, which, was, which gave the pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> but what we realize is that this example of the card trick two secrets in one this applies to everything in life everything in life every factual material object we look at in our lives is a secret and behind that secret is a second secret which is the, the, the meaning, the, the system, the genius, the feeling, the love that supports uh, that secret. So on the one hand, we live in a material world where we look at facts. This is the world of philosophers. We look at facts. We say, yes, it's raining. No, the, there's an apple on my plate. Yes, I'm uh, one meter 70, etc., etc. But the reality behind it is the divine reality, the divine secret. This is the one that's being revealed to us in Bhagavad Gita. This is the one that's supported by devotion and love. And this is the one we're looking at. So we shouldn't read the book thinking we're going to have a factual revelation like the Eight of Hearts. We should read the book in order to make contact with the, the, the system of spiritual understanding, divine understanding, that lies uh, behind it. So our challenge, again, is not to just be satisfied with the outer cover of the world or of our own lives, but to search for the inner meaning. And the more we have desire for that, the more the love of that inner meaning will uh, reveal itself to us. So sort to of make stronger this relationship between us and the, uh, the inner world, the secret world, the divine world. That's a little story about secrets. Maybe we could call it a vidya, if you like. Now let's continue with the, the text of the purport by Prabhupada. I'll read slowly here and you can follow. The chapter of Bhagavad Gita is called the king of education because it is the essence of all doctrines and philosophies explained before. So it's, this, it's the assembly of all the things that have come before. There are seven principal philosophers in India. Gautama, Kaunada, Kapila, Yagyan Valkya, Sandilya, Vaishwamara, and finally, the most famous of them all, Vyashadeva, the author of Vedanta Sutra and many things. So there's no lack of, there's no dearth of knowledge, no lack of knowledge, says Prabhupada, in the field of philosophy or transcendental knowledge. Now the Lord says that this ninth chapter, the one we're reading, is the king of all such knowledge, the essence of all knowledge that can be derived from the study of the Vedas and different kinds of philosophy. And here is the important part. It is the most confidential because confidential or transcendental knowledge, transcendental knowledge involves understanding the difference between the soul and the body. That's the second secret, the higher secret, the deeper secret. This difference between the soul and the body, this is what was established in the first chapters of Bhagavad Gita that we haven't read but remember we summarize them. It's the, 
discovery that we have an atma, that we have a soul, and that this soul is related to the paramatma, the super soul of God. This is the introduction of Kopibhav, the relation, the immediate relation of the disciple, the devotee to Krishna. It's the first step in the path of devotional um, evolution. And this is just what Prabhupada says then. It is the most confidential kind of knowledge because confidential or transcendental knowledge involve, involves understanding the difference between the soul and body. So once we know the, under, the difference between soul and body, between what's outside us in the external material world and what's inside us in the spiritual world, once we understand that, then we understand the system be, behind Radhika's card trick. And we understand the, the divine system that lies behind all things. And the king of all confidential knowledge, Prabhupada says then, culminates in devotional service. So the very top level is when we can take all these things in and understand them as devotional, as a question of loving relationship, relationship between God and devotee, between super soul and uh, individual soul, between uh, uh, the soul and the material world. Prabhupada continues now. Generally, People are not educated in the confidential knowledge. This is, of course, the problem. We're all educated in the book knowledge. We go to schools, we learn the book knowledge, we learn the, the formulas, and we memorize, and we take our tests, and we have our grades, and we go out of school and, and take a job. This is what we're educated in. But we're not educated, says Prabhupada, in the confidential knowledge in the spiritual second secret I was talking about. They are educated, he says, Prabhupada says, in external knowledge, the knowledge of facts of the world, the world outside us. As far as an ordinary education is concerned, Prabhupada says, people are involved with so many departments, politics, sociology, physics, chemistry, mathematics, astronomy, engineering. There are so many departments of knowledge, he says, all over the world and many huge universities. But there is unfortunately no university education or educational institution where the science of spirit soul is instructed. Devotional service is not taught in any school not really the case. In most schools, it's not taught. It's all a philosophical, factual, book-like education that we have. And yet, says Prabhupada, the soul is the most important part of this body. Without the presence of the soul, the body has no value. Still, people are placing great stress on bodily necessities of life, not caring for the vital soul. So as I was saying before, we're putting stress on the things that we have and not on the things that we are. And the most important mm, example of that problem is the way we love. Loving others for what they have, loving ourselves for what we have, and not for the spirit soul that we are. We are a spirit soul. It is not that we have a spirit soul. Everything else we have we have two arms, we have a body, but our spirit soul is who we are, having and being. Yeah. Try. <laughs> Bhagavad Gita uh, Prabhupada continues, especially from the second chapter, stresses the importance of the soul. In the very beginning, he says, the Lord says that this body is perishable and that the soul is not perishable. This we all understand. This is a confidential part of knowledge. Already we don't teach this in the schools, only in religious schools, I suppose. This is a confidential part of knowledge, Prabhupada says, simply knowing that spirit soul is different from this body and that its nature is immutable, unchangeable, 
indestructible and eternal. If only this bare, this simple principle, we could meditate on this, we could meditate a life on it, and it would bring us so much pleasure, so much happiness. And some of us do, and some of us try. Prabhupada continues, sometimes people are under the impression that the soul is different from the body, and that when this body is finished, or one is liberated from the body, the soul remains in a void and becomes impersonal. But actually, that is not the fact. How can the soul, which is active within the body, be inactive after being liberated from the body? It is always active. If it is eternal, then it is eternally active. And its activities in the spiritual kingdom are the most confidential part of spiritual knowledge. What is the solution to this riddle? It is that we have a spiritual body that, that is opposed to our material body. In the spiritual world, we have a body, a svarupa, a form, a personality, and this is our spiritual body. And in this spiritual body, in the spiritual world, we can, we can act, we can carry out a devotion, we can act and love others in the spiritual way, in the spiritual plane. So the body is understood more as a means for acting, a means for vidya, for expressing practical knowledge. In the material world, we can carry out the devotional practice, we can love others materially, physically. In the spiritual world, we carry out devotion and love others and become close to uh, others through our spiritual bodies. Knowledge, Prabhupada says now, is the purest form of all activities, as explained in Vedic literature. In the Padma Purana, man's sinful activities have been analyzed and are shown to be the results of sin after sin. And what is that sin? Gurudev often tells us, reminds us, the primary sin is not to realize that we have a soul, that we are soul conscious, and that there's a difference between soul and body. Prabhupada goes on, those who are engaged in fruitative activities are entangled in different stages and forms of sinful reactions, different ways of forgetting that we are a soul, different ways of making a distance between um, soul and, and body. For example, he says, when the seed of a particular tree is sown, the tree does not appear immediately to grow. It takes some time. It is first a small sprouting plant, then it assumes the form of a tree, then it flowers, bears fruit. And when it is complete, the flowers and fruits are enjoyed by persons who have sown the seeds of the tree. Similarly, a man performs a sinful act, and like a seed, it takes time to fructify. There are different stages. The sinful action may have already stopped within the individual, but the results of the fruit of that sinful action are still enjoyed. There are sins which are still in the form of a seed, and there are others which are already fructified and giving us fruit, which we are enjoying as distress and pain, as explained in the 20th verse of the, verse of the seventh chapter. So our distance from our spiritual life, our sp difference from our spiritual form, causes what Prabhupada calls sin in the world, causes suffering, greater or lesser, for longer or shorter periods uh, of time. And the closer we are to realizing ourselves as who we are, as spiritual beings, and not the spiritual uh, things that we own, the things that we have, the less there will be suffering in the future. It's all part of a karmic 
process that goes on eternally. And this, um, Prabhupada explains in what follows, a person who has completely ended the reactions of all sinful activities and who is fully engaged in pious activities, being freed from the duality of the material world, becomes engaged in devotional service to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So once we have fully realized that we are soul consciousness, that is fully stopped sinful activities, activities done in forgetfulness of our soul, uh, and engaged in activities which are done in full remembrance of our soul, then we, were, we, we become freed from the material world and we can begin our devotion, our loving service directly to the spiritual, to the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Krishna. Once again, there is no moralization here. When we talk about sinful activities in Bhagavad Gita, Prabhupada is talking about um, this forgetfulness. It's not like good and bad, like we have in the Western Abrahamic religions, good and bad and sins and redemptions. Not at all this. It's far more a question of being acquainted with our own self, soul consciousness and being able to be fully ourselves within that soul consciousness. Therefore, Prabhupada goes on, the purifying potency of devotional service is very strong. And it is called Pavitram Uttamam, the purest. Uttamam means transcendental. Tamas means material world or darkness. And of course then Uttamam means going beyond means that which is transcendental to material activities, that which is belong the, beyond the material. This purifying potency of devotional service is the energy of Radharani. It's the energy of, of love. This is what permits purification through devotional service. When we do devotional service, we express our inner love, we become adept at expressing our inner love. We find our identity as loving beings. And this is the energy that drives us, drives our desire to become more pure in our loving and drives our devotional service forward. Prabhupada continues, devotional activities are never to be considered material, although sometimes it appears that devotees are engaged just like ordinary men. Mm. Mm. So you can remember the example I gave last time or two times ago of two people washing the temple floor side by side, the same bucket of water, the same brush, the same knees and hands on the floor, but the one is doing it in devotional service and the other is doing it without devotional service. The one is doing it in devotional service is already in the spiritual world doing this work. Already, um, already engaged in the spiritual world, even when the, the body is hands and knees on the temple floor. So one can see, Prabhupada says, and is familiar with devotional service. However, will know that they are not material activities. They are spiritual and devotional, uncontaminated by the material modes of nature. Yeah. We have power outage here. <laughs> Prabhupada, Prabhupada continues then saying, it is said that the execution of devotional service is so perfect that one can perceive the results directly. When we do devotional service with a pure heart, with pure loving uh, uh, intention, then we feel immediately the results. Mm -hmm. Everyone has experienced this, at least for a small moment, a moment of time, mm -hmm. this pure presence in whatever we're doing. And it could be the most mundane thing, as you know, doing the dishes 
washing the floor, driving the car, doing your job, when it's done purely present with oneself, with the spiritual consciousness, then the pleasure is immediate. We feel this inner peace immediately. Han says... <laughs> Material thing not touch. No material thing not touch. <laughs> Prabhupada says then the result is actually perceived. And we have practical experience that any person who is chanting the holy names of Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Rama Hare Hare, in the course of time, feels some transcendental pleasure and very quickly becomes purified of all material contamination. I don't need to try to convince you of this. I think we all know this. This is actually seen, Prabhupada says. Furthermore, if one engages not only in hearing, but in trying to broadcast this message of devotional activities to others. Or if he or she engages himself or herself in helping the missionary activities of Krishna consciousness, he gradually feels spiritual progress. The advancement in spiritual life does not depend on any kind of previous education or qualification. On the contrary, Gurudev would say. <laughs> Our only qualification is to not have qualification. <laughs> the best devotee, and Gurudev nodding if you want to know, yes. <laughs> the best qualification is to be pure of all the philosophy and all the book knowledge and just have a pure and open heart. In the Vedanta Sutra, says Prabhupada. This is also described in the following words. Prakashas cha karmani ab abhyasat. Translation, devotional service is so potent that simply by engaging in the activities of devotional service, one becomes enlightened without a doubt. And as you can see, maybe, I underscored the word potent, because whenever we see potency, when we're talking about devotional service, we know where this energy is coming from. It's Radharani's divine loving energy, which is powering devotion. And but since it's powering devotional service, according to Prabhupada, it's also powering our enlightenment, powering our happiness. And then Prabhupada tells a, we could call this a vidya. He tells a little story. He talks about Narada. Narada, who happened to be the son of a maidservant, had no education, nor was he born into a high family. But when his mother was engaged in serving great devotees, Narada also became engaged. And sometimes, in the absence of his mother, he would serve the great devotees himself. So already, Narada is practicing a kind of association with his mother, the other devotee, and benefiting from this. Prabhupada continues. What does he continue? <laughs> Narada personally says, once only, by their permission, I took the remnants of their food. And by so, so doing, my sins were at once eradicated. Thus being engaged, I became purified in heart. And at that time, the very nature of the transcendentalist became attractive to him. So by eating the remnants of the food of the purified devotees in association with his mother, also a, a, a devotee, a pure devotee. 
his heart is engaged. Through this intimate sharing of the remnants of food, his heart becomes engaged. And what happens immediately? Attraction. Pleasure potency arises. He's attracted lovingly to the company of the, of the devotees. Narada, I go on and in, with Prabhupada, Narada tells his disciple, Vyasha Deva, that in a previous life, he was engaged as a boy servant of purified devotees. This is essentially the same story told again. During four months of their stay, and he was intimately associating with them. Intimately associating. Sometimes those sages left remnants of food on their dishes, and so the boy who would wash their dishes wanted to take the remnants. So he asked the great devotees whether he could eat them, and they gave their permission. Narada then ate those remnants and consequently became freed from all sinful reactions. As he went on eating, he gradually became as pure-hearted as the sages, and he gradually developed the same taste. So the more we have contact with the intimate, uh, intimate product of the devotees, the intimate experience, the food from their very lips, the more we have this intimate association, the more the, the intimate feelings, the devotional feelings grow in our own heart. And the more our heart is purified because the love in our hearts purifies our hearts. The more love there is in our heart, the more purified our heart is. And the more we develop taste for more. It's like a snowball. The more our heart is pure, the more we desire more love and the more love to share and to give. Prabhupada goes on, the great devotees relish the taste of an unceasing devotional service of the Lord, hearing, chanting, and uh, etc. And by developing the same taste, Narada also wanted to hear and chant the glories of the Lord. Thus, by associating with the sages, he developed a great desire for devotional service. Therefore, he quotes from the Vedanta Sutra, as follows, if one is engaged simply in the acts of devotional service, everything is revealed to him automatically, and he can understand. This is called prakasha, directly perceived. So it's not even an effort. Once we open ourselves to this, to the, to the love, let the love come in, let ourselves be associated with loving devotion, then the development is automatic. No investment necessary, no work necessary. It's free, it's automatic. This is the definition of mercy itself. And it's called prakrasha, directly perceived. It doesn't come from outside anywhere. It's not given to us from anything outside of us. It comes directly from us. It's very much like the vijnana that we talked about before, about the experience of a, the knowledge of a reality, which is our own reality within inside us. When we feel the association, when we feel the devotional pleasure, it awakes in us something which is immediately ours. We don't have to ask for it. We don't have to pay, pay for it. Amazon style, like Gurudev would say. It's not a transaction. It's not instrumental. It's immediate and immediately felt. Prabhupada goes on and we'll, we'll come in for landing on this first and then we'll finish and I'll open the floor. He goes on, um, the child Narada also got the opportunity, and simply by association, again, only by association, he achieved the highest goal of all religions, devotional service. So once again, as Gurudev teaches us, not religion itself, not religion understood as Vaidhi Bhakta, Bhakti, not religion understood, understood as rules and regulations and doctrines, but devotional service, the experience that transcends religion, which is the above religion. Prabhupada says in Srimad Bhagavatam, it is said that religious people, here's the justification of Gurudev's idea, 
in religious people, they generally do not know that the highest perfection of religion is the attainment of the stage of de devotional service. So religious people don't even see that they're not quite at the highest stage that they need to transcend. Devotional service is the key. Radharani. Service to devotion to Radharani will bring us to transcend religion. And religious people would see that they, they're, it's one step away from them. Generally, Prabhupada says, Vedic knowledge is required for the understanding of the path of self-realization. Generally, it's required. But, he says, here, although he was not educated in Vedic principles, Narada, the poor, uneducated boy, no qualifications, acquired the highest results of Vedic study. Never opened a book. And he went right to the top. This process is so potent that even without performing the religious process regularly, the rituals and the rules and the norms, one can be raised to the highest perfection. And once again, I remind you the word potency, which is the presence of Radharani and her loving energy in the process. It's she who lifts us above the religious process. It's she who lives us above, lifts us above the doctrine. Huh? How is this possible? Prabhupada asks. This is also confirmed in Vedic literature. Acharya van Paruso Veda, one who is in association with great Acharyas, even if he is not educated or has not studied the Vedas, can become familiar with all the knowledge necessary for realization. No qualifications necessary. And this is in the Vedas itself. We read in the Vedas that you can transcend the Vedas just by association, just by devotional service. The process of devotional service is a very happy one, says Prabhupada. Why? Well, devotional service, he says, consists of svaranam, kirtanam, visno. Wow. In other words, one can simply chant and hear the glories of the Lord, which is lots of fun. <laughs> chant and hear the glories of the Lord or can attend philosophical lectures on transcendental knowledge given by authorized acharyas. Simply by sitting, he says, one can learn. Sit, sit down, open your ears, open your eyes, open your heart. Simply by sitting, one can learn. Then one can eat the remnants of food offered to God. Nice palatable dishes. In every state, Devotional service is joyful. One can execute devotional service, he says, even in the most poverty-stricken conditions. The Lord says, Patram Puspam Phalam. He is ready to accept any fruit, any offering, no matter what. Even a leaf, a flower, a bit of fruit, a little water, which are all available for every part of the world can be offered by any person, regardless of social position, and it will be accepted if offered with love. There's only one condition, that it's offered with love. There are many instances in history, he says, simply by tasting tulasi leaves offered to the lotus feet of the Lord, great sages like Sanat Kumra, became great devotees. Just one taste of a, of a, of a tulasi leaf. And I can think one, of, one, one special example very close to my heart. And when uh, Dada Govinda Das Babaji gave a grain of rice on the mouth of our dear Gurudev, and he became mad for six months and became a pure devotee. 
Therefore, he says, Prabhupada, the devotional process is very nice and can be executed in a happy mood. God accepts only the love with which things are offered to him. I say again, God accepts only the love with which things are offered to him. If, as long as you attach love to the offering you give, then it's accepted with great pleasure by God. The love is Radha, says Gopika. <laughs> this love is Radha, says Gopika. <laughs> It is said here that this devotional service eternally is eternally existing. It is not as the Maya, uh, Mayavadi philosophers claim. They sometimes take so-called devotional service, and as long as they are not liberated, they continue their devotional service. But at the end, when they become liberated, they become one with God, and then they stop. So Mayavedi, Mayavedi philosophers, these are the impersonal philosophers. Or some people say that the people, the philosophers who are in Maya. But it's the ones who are impersonal. And once they've reached Brahman, when Brahman, once they've reached the liberation, then they think devotion is over. For, yes. Mayavedi philosophers are impersonal philosophers. Those who do not believe that that Krishna has personality, has a personal form, has a loving personal form. And their goal is to reach liberation by doing devotion. Once they reach liberation, once they've left their bodies, devotion stops. But we believe that devotion is carried out best in the spiritual body. So once we've achieved our spiritual svarupa, our spiritual body, Devotion only continues at a higher level, more deeply. So this is the criticism that Prabhupada has of Mayaveda philosophers. Since there's no personality of Godhead, God has no personality for the Mayavedis, then there's nothing that happens after we've attained God. But we who have a devotional relationship also on the spiritual plane enjoy the personality because we also have spiritual personalities. We also have an individual svarup, individual spiritual identity. Hmm? 14. Hmm? 14. When the devotees go to the spiritual planet in the kingdom of God, he is also engaged there in serving the Supreme Lord. He does not try to become one with the Supreme Lord. That is the Prabhupada says this is the devotional approach, the personalist approach. We'll just finish one more paragraph here and then we'll uh, stop. As it will be seen, Prabhupada says, actual devotional service begun, begins after liberation. So in Bhagavad Gita, it is said, Brahma Bhuta after being liberated or being situated in Brahman position together with God, one's devotional service begins. By executing devotional service, one can understand the Supreme Lord. Doing devotion, loving devotion, we become closer and closer and closer to Radharani in our, in our Manjari, uh, in our Manjari Bhav. No one can understand Supreme Personality of Godhead by executing Karma Yoga, Jnana Yoga, or Ashtanga Yoga, or any other yoga independently. So Karma Yoga, this is the, the, the yoga of selfless action. Jnana Yoga, this is the yoga of philosophy. Ashtanga Yoga, this is the yoga of eight steps towards godliness. But only the yoga of bhakti, of devotional service, will let us understand and have a relationship with the personality of Godhead. In Srimad Bhagavatam, Prabhupada says, it is also confirmed that when one becomes purified by executing the process of devotional service, 
especially by hearing Sh Srimad Bhagavatam or Bhagavad Gita from realized souls, then he can understand the science of Krishna or the science of God. So the system, the radical Kartrik system behind the, the science of, uh, of behind reality, the science of God, the true science of God, not the philosophical one, not the book one, but the devotional one. Evam prasanana manaso bhagavat bhakti yogata. He says, in other words, when one, one's heart is cleared of all nonsense, then one can understand what God is. We need to clean, says Gurudev. Hmm. Thus, the process of devotional service of Krishna consciousness is the king of all education, the king of all confidential knowledge. It is the purest form of religion, and it can be executed joyfully, without difficulty. Therefore, says Prabhupada, one should adopt it. I'm convinced. <laughs> there are stop talking. Does anyone would like to comment or share or question? Gurudev is here too to, to talk or do you want to say something, Gurudev? Can you ask a question? Oh, I'm sorry. I don't know. Question more like comment. I, I just thought it was so nice the, what you said about the, um, if we love someone, like the quality is not this is a bit like envious or not, not pure love. And then I, I just felt also with. Um, because Guru Devo said that Guru Nishtha only comes if we really know the form or see the form of, of Guru Dev, because then we really love Guru Dev mm. in in the soul form because we, we see we see him directly. Mm. And this this just felt really, really beautiful that mm. we can only really purely love someone if we have our own spiritual body, if we can because then we can really see the other person as what they really are. Beautifully this, said. Uh, this is why Guru Dev's love unto us is so strong because he sees our, sorry, he sees our soul form and knows it. Very nice. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Come sit here. Oh, you good. <laughs> Go ahead. Thank you. Yes, I'm a little late, but I remember this morning we spoke about also the uh, the soul and the heart and the childish nature, mm. and that to realize the soul is only this the first step, because this is a more or less an inactive situation for the soul, and. Uh, what we learn here in, from our Gurudev is an active form that he calls love in action. Mm. And uh, this love is situated in the heart. And we fill this heart and grow in the heart more and more. There is a container and the name is heart. <laughs> we fill it with love and feelings. And this container, when it's filled with love and feelings, is crying out for a possibility to share this with others. And then, in that moment, we cry out. Then the Guru come. Mm -hmm. And he gives, by his mercy and the mercy of Swamini, the body we need to share this loving feeling. And this is very rare to find a place where the Guru is so merciful to give this body to a crying soul. 
And there is nothing more to get in all three worlds. And so we, yesterday we had this beautiful Purnima, Guru Purnima. And we can be so happy. And this is <clears throat> what we all get more and more on this place, on this holy place here in the ground of Vrindavan. <laughs> in Keller, what is in English? <laughs> in the basement. <laughs> this is unbelievable what we get here. And we cannot really realize this, but it is true. It takes place. Our soul is getting the gift of an eternal body with eternal senses mm -hmm. to share love and feelings in relationship. Mm -hmm. This is the greatest one soul can get. And after getting that, there is nothing to search for. Finish. <laughs> there is, <laughs> the soul is, is there where she belongs to. And this is not an inactive place like Nirvana or Brahma Jyoti, whatever we, we say to this. This is a very active place to share loving feelings with a body, with an eternal body. It's so great to get it here. And also what we share here, this is so beautiful. Thank you. Prima makes sense, no? Prima makes sense, of course. You have to move. Non-stop. <laughs> Yeah. One question for Mira. Does religion as religious rituals and doctrine have any place if one is searching to cultivate a deep personal and intimate relation to the divine? Would it have you want to? It, in my opinion, it can. But there's a danger that we become distracted by, by the, the limiting rules and regulations and expectations and rituals and don't see beyond them. Of course, here in Miran, in Vrindavan, we have nothing but rituals all day long. We, we go to temple five times a day and we do everything just as it's described and prescribed and we say the, no, the prayers and there's lots of rituals so as long as we keep sorry i crashed Mira, it was a bolt of lightning that uh, came down and uh, stopped me in my words as i think as uh, rituals are important to to structure and we have much to learn from from doctrine and we in Vrindavan we follow them all the time all day long but we're not limited by them and they, they, they don't uh, distract us from the higher goal, which is to leave behind us the, the, the trappings and the limitations and to, and to seek only the fulfillment of our hearts, the higher devotional service in a spiritual body. Would it have you want to, want to add something? So Gurudev likes that, that we speak. And uh, it's so nice that uh, our Uddhava is always giving Bhagavad Gita class, even if I'm mostly a little late in the morning, because my rhythm is at the moment not fixed. I just come from Europe. But the explanation is so beautiful. And uh, religion, this is only my, my opinion, my opinion, religion is necessary in this world, that the people live in peace somehow, as much as is possible. For this, Krishna himself give this like rules and regulations how to live together 
And if we respect this, human can live in peace in this world somehow. But one or two problems will stay even in the religious systems. We will getting a body, we will growing, getting old, and we will die. But sometimes also sickness is possible. It's very rare, but we heard about it. And so even by this religious principles, there is no really solution to come out of this. Solution is the right word. So we can follow religious principles. We can stay in an institution. Why not? It's not bad. But at all, it will not help us. It will not. It will not bring us out of the problems. And uh, to to really come out of this problems we get with age, what also Prabhupada always spoke about, no? old age will coming and Narayan Maharaj, he said, old age will embrace you. And that is not coming out f- by religious uh, practice. But we will find a solution by a spiritual practice. When we realize ourselves as an eternal soul, when we do this, accept it, then this is the first step to come out of this temporary system we live in as an eternal being. And when on this way, we realize the soul, then we have to accept the qualities of the soul. Soul is Sachit Ananda. That means blissful, but inactive. So, and then we come to the point here in this basement <laughs> that we find this point from love in action. So, and there the soul can become active. Come out, the bliss comes out of this by exchange, loving, feeling in relationship. This is what we learn here. And the next step is, okay, now we are a soul, we are happy, we have some relationship, but we're still in a temporary body. What is the solution out of this? Okay, then we also, in this basement, possible, we get a spiritual body. And this is a unique place, I would say, maybe in, I don't know, I don't know other place in this world. And we come in an eternal stage of soul consciousness in a spiritual body to exchange love and feelings in relationship to our goddess, to our Swamini. And we sit here on her footsteps. They are here on our heads. And we are very lucky to get this. And so we can decide now, should we follow religious principles to stay here in a peaceful place somehow, but we will leave the body? Or should we accept that there is an eternal body with eternal senses, a beautiful place for our soul? We can decide what we like to do. (laughs) So that's my solution, my answer to this question. For the religious. That's a very wonderful answer. Thank you. And Miradidi says thank you. And 
You are so blessed to be in the basement with Gurudev and each other, she said. Thank you, Mary. Body basement is important because if you put the washer, all will go to the lowest place. Mm. <laughs> so this is Mahaprabhu says, Trinada peace makes it. You have to become lowest than lowest. Then you can realize it. If you have a false ego, you cannot get it. You have to be lowest than a small grass. And humble and tolerant. Thank like you. a tree. Like a tree. <laughs> Mahaprabhu made very easy, no? Simple. So I choose and all Gopinath and other sons, all this decide you have to live in the basement to understand that and teach. So this is not my effort. The mercy of Radharani inspired to all devotees to do that. And I am following what he wants. It's not my efforts. I never I didn't do any efforts in my life. It's all the algorithm. We not also want to care. Neither did this right Jai Gurudev. Radhe Radhe Wow, so nice. Beautiful to come together and um, yeah, engage with uh, the students in the basement. Uh, yeah, yeah, thank, thank you. you. No, we're just saying that we are so blessed as so. uh Buddha Bhai also said that this is the place where love in action really is put in practice. That's something which I, I, I could hear uh, from his class. I was not there the whole time, but uh, when I entered now, I could feel a very beautiful, yeah, beautiful Bhai. atmosphere. And uh, I can tell that it's really the teaching of Gurudev. We can apply in every scripture. Materona. And we can apply it even in every day-to-day -day life in all our activities, in cooking, like now it's just happening. <laughs> Corn is being prepared for all of us. <laughs> so how to fill our life with love. And actually, simplicity, I feel, is the key because when Gurudev was saying, Trinada Pisunichina, Mahaprabhu's Shikshastatkam, his eight formulas in life if we apply those eight we will see that it works really and Gurudev is the living example of it he always says the first verse Cheto Darpo Marjanam clean the mirror of the heart and how to clean that mirror of the heart which is full of stains right you know that is Gurudev's mercy if we let that in our life enter it starts removing. It's a process. It takes time and nothing to worry about it. Just have to have faith in, in his words and his teaching. And humility, simplicity sounds like something, you know, is it possible or not? But if we try it, if we try one day just to put our ego, our desires aside and think for what they want, what do Radha Mohan want today from me? They want me to be in a loving way to apply this love in action in my day-to-day -day life. If I try it one day and then two days and three days, we will see the results will come very fast in our lives. So thank you so much. Uh, very, uh, a small uh, input from, from here, from, from the basement. And uh, yeah, Radhe Radhe. Okay, in that case, then I'll just say thank you to your, for your 
for being there. It's lovely to see your faces. It uh, lifts me, lifts us all to be together like this. And I really look forward to seeing you next week again. Radhe, radhe.